Let me invite us all now to stand and join our voices with all of creation in declaring the glory of God. Most of us remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable, but through that pain, we witnessed the resolve of a nation. We saw chaos give birth to courage. Fear transform into fortitude. And destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve with the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember and we will never forget. Please pray with me. Lord God, um, while we will never forget, help us to be reminded of your faithfulness in the midst of all that happened 20 years ago and in the midst of all that is happening now. 
Help us to be reminded of your loving care, of your graciousness and mercy in all of our lives. Father, as we continue to learn how we are to share the cure with our neighbors and friends and family members, help us to be mindful that we should always be prepared to give the reason for the hope that we have, but with gentleness and respect. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you today. We know that that freedom is present here, but it is not free everywhere around the world. And we pray for the persecuted church as well. Father, in all these things, we give thanks. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's so glad to see you here today. A couple of things that I want to remind you of. Um, in case you don't know, and sometimes I even forget the new things, is that we do have a digital bulletin with sermon notes that are available on our church app. So that if you like to follow along with Pastor Mark's notes, you're even able to fill it in. And so be sure and check that out on our um, app. You can download it today and find out at redlandbaptist.org app. If today is your first time visiting with us or your first time in a long time, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Um, we would invite you to fill out our Connect card, which is available by scanning um, the QR code, which you see up on the screen. You can scan it in your chair where you're seated now or at home on the screen. Or you can go to our website and on the I'm New button in the top right-hand side um, banner, you can um, click on that and it'll drop down and allow you to fill out the Connect card. This allows us to get to know you a little bit better and helps you find ways to get connected with activities here at Redland Baptist Church. Fall registrations continue. We have lots of things happening. Last Sunday was our first Sunday with a new Sunday morning schedule. Last Wednesday night, we were back on campus for Wednesday night dinner and choirs and all of the fun things. So you should want to be sure and check that out. If you need help finding a grace group, an adult grace group class, there are lists of adult grace groups um, at the welcome desk in the foyer, or you can ask any staff members or find me at the preschool desk. Um, now, I believe Pastor Kevin has info about our upcoming um, church-wide family camping trip in October, so I'm going to invite him up. All right. Thank you, Peggy. And I'm also going to invite Lucas Lee up to help me with something very important. And we are looking forward to our family camping trip. Uh, this is open to the entire church. Anyone uh, can come and be a part of this. It's going to be at Little Bennett uh, Park up in Clarksburg. Now, Lucas... I found in the grocery store, this says fire s'mores. These are pre-toasted s'mores ready to eat. And I got curious, what could these be like? And I thought it would be a good idea for you to try one and let us know how they compare to the real thing. Are you ready? Okay. All right, so, so reach in, grab one. All right, so this is a pre-made s'more. Yeah, go ahead. Feel free, feel free to eat it. While he is trying this, I will let you know that registration is up for the camping trip. And uh, it is October 8th through 10. We have about 15 slots. What do you think? Oh, okay. All right. So it's pretty good. So would this take the place of a regular s'more in your mind? Okay. All right. Now, if... If you agree, wonderful. If you say, you know, there's something like the real thing at the campfire site uh, and watching that marshmallow ooze down, then sign up and join us. We will have us more waiting for you. Thanks a lot. Good job, buddy. As we continue in our worship, let me invite you, if you would, please, to stand as we continue to sing.
In God, we always have a place to go. Whether we are distressed or discouraged or even depressed, we have a Heavenly Father to whom we can go. And there we will find His arms open wide, ready to receive and support and even carry us if needed. And it is in Him, in this place, that we are home. Your son for 
current crisis we're going through, I just have to stop and say thank you for these, these trials of life that humble us and remind us that we need you. Thank you for the fact that we know that in these times and all times, we can run to you again and again and again and be received with your grace and love. I pray you'd help us to run to you today, God, for the needs that we have in order to live this life and ways that bring you glory and live in a ways that more and more people come to experience your forgiveness and grace through faith in Jesus. And I ask this in his name, amen. Now, I was noticing, I think that uh, Lee guy, I forgot his first name, might have wanted some more of that. Uh, Kevin, that's good. Now, I know what I'm about to say uh, will make you realize I'm older than I look. Uh, but back in the day, way back in the day, when I went to college, the cost of my full-time tuition was, are you ready? $325 a semester, full time, yeah. I'm thinking some of you parents with college age kids are thinking, couldn't we just come up with a time machine? I'll send them back, you know, with a few hundred bucks to pay for college and bring them back because you know by experience that to today's tuition can be 50 times that or, or, or more. And this high cost of tuition is one reason many going broke moms and dads have complained about the odd classes that Today's institution of higher institutions, rather of higher learning, charge so much for their children to take. To find out some proof of that, I got Professor Google's help, and I found an article that lists some of the sad but true examples of what I'm talking about. Frostburg State University, just up the road a couple hours, offers a course entitled The Science of Harry Potter. It's taught by a Professor Plitnik who to me sounds like one of the guys from the books, you know, Plitnik, doesn't that sound familiar? And then Duke University offers a class called Hashtag Selfie. 
Now, I'm sure there's probably some substance beneath that title, but I'm thinking most kids in college already know everything about taking a selfie and how to hashtag it all over the place. And then Alfred University in New York State has a course called Tight Watery, or The Good Life on a Dollar a Day. Now, I'm thinking some parents might actually like this class, feel it was worth the tuition, because it could help some undergrads survive earning a degree that gives little or no hireability in today's job market. And then the University of Pennsylvania has one called Wasting Time on the Internet, uh, which is what I hope I haven't done in reading this article on the Internet. Anyhow, today we're going to take a class together that is far from worthless, and I say that because what we're going to learn has eternal significance. Our professor is the Apostle Paul, and his course is entitled Cure Sharing 101. The textbook for this class, and by the way, every class we offer here at Redland is the Bible. So take your hopefully well-worn copy and turn to Acts chapter 18 and stand with me if able as I read verses 1 through 22. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes and protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one's going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, Settle the matter for yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Galileo showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And I hope you got it with that last verse. Uh, Paul's second missionary journey ends right where it began in the city of Antioch. Now, before we get to our class today, Cure Sharing 101, let me give you some background on the text that's the basis of this course, okay? The city of Corinth had been an important city for a long time, since way back in the days of, of Homer. That first Corinth sur survived until 146 B.C., and I say first because in that year, a Roman legion destroyed it totally, burning it, tearing down all the walls. They, they literally leveled the city, and it was a deserted ruin for the next 100 years. Then in 46 BC, Julius Caesar came to power in Rome. He recognized the strategic importance of Corinth, both for commercial and, and military purposes, and he ordered his soldiers to rebuild it. Then he populated the second Corinth with Italians, more specifically retired Roman soldiers, 
Uh, he gave them property there, you know, rewarding them for their military service. And gradually over the years, the descendants of the Greeks who had lived in the original Corinth returned themselves. And they weren't the only ones who came back. Syrians came, Asians, Egyptians, um, even Jews mingled in because Corinth became a very popular place for Jews to flee when Claudius expelled them from Rome in 41 AD. Um, so it, it made Corinth a very cosmopolitan city, lots of different uh, races and ethnic groups. There was also a large slave population there, and I'll explain why in a moment. Now, geographically, Corinth was at a crossroads, as you can see on the map. Uh, it was located on an isthmus that collects, connects northern Greece where Athens is, remember all those Areopagus eggheads, egg connects it with southern Greece, which is called Achaia. Uh, so if you wanted to travel from the southern part of Greece, Achaia, to the northern part, you had to go through Corinth. And if you wanted to travel from the northern part down into Achaia in the so south, you had to go through Corinth. So Julius Caesar was right, because all roads in that area led to and through Corinth. Here's something else that added to the strategic importance of this city. As you can see, there are bodies of water on both sides of this narrow strip of land that, where Corinth sat. And it was treacherous to sail all the way around the entire bottom, around Achaia. So it was so treacherous that often ships would stop at Corinth, and here's where the high slave population comes in. They would stop there because the captain would get hundreds of these poor enslaved people to put the ship on a skid, and then they would move it on land, the four mile trek across this uh, narrow isthmus from one body of water to the other. I think they have a canal there today. Well, this was expensive, you know, but it actually saved lives because of all the lives that were lost in the storms if you tried to sail across the south. And it also saved a lot of time. And it benefited Corinth because sailors and merchants were in town longer. I mean, not only was it a port, ships, literally rolled through the streets of Corinth. You know, a few months back, we went down to Norfolk for Daniel's promotion ceremony, and as I came around a corner in, in the car, I could see this aircraft carrier. Uh, it was on dry dock, but it looked like it was sitting right in the middle of that downtown street. And I thought of that because that's the kind of image that was common in Corinth. There were probably street signs warning pedestrians, you know, and chariots, you know, yield to ships as they, they pass by. All kidding aside, this second Corinth became a very rich city with products from all over the world flooding into its markets. Things like Arabian balsam wood, Libyan ivory, Babylonian carpets, Lyconian wool. Sounds kind of like it was the pottery barn of the ancient world, you know. Well, with all this commerce flowing through its streets, it's not surprising to learn that the leaders of this city were very wealthy merchants who almost literally worshipped money. Corinth was also the home to the Isthmian Games, games, uh, athletic contests that were second only to the, the Olympics. But Corinth was primarily known not for its commerce, not for the ships going down the streets, not for these athletic games. No, it was primarily known for its sin. I mean, not only were thousands of people enslaved there, which is sin, people who came to gamble on the Isthmian Games stayed, and they indulged in every appetite, not just the sin of gambling, but like our Las Vegas, but uh, Corinth became kind of a mecca of, of, of sexuality. In fact, the leading religion of that city actually promoted prostitution. You see, Corinth had a temple that was the center of worship for the goddess Aphrodite. That's a picture of what it looked like. And in the evening, the temple would have thousands of sacred priestesses who were actually prostitutes, flood down into the streets of Corinth to sell their bodies to business travelers, to sailors, to tourists, to athletes, uh, to residents, to anybody who wanted a so-called religious experience, experience in Corinth. So this was literally a red light district city, a city that was soaked in sin. You, you could describe Corinth as temptation on steroids because there was so much immorality there. The Greeks actually coined a term from the name of the city, the word Corinthianize. And to Corinthianize something was to make it sexually charged, uh, sexually immoral, sexually unrestrained. And for a woman to be referred to as a Corinthian, well, it's, let's just say it wasn't a compliment. With this in mind, I want you to picture Paul entering the city to start a church. 
What an unlikely place to do that. What a challenge it must have been to share the cure in that place. And I need to stop and point out that the job we are called to as a local church here in Derwood, Maryland, is usually not easy. Following our head, our Lord, as his local body, working to share the cure is often a very difficult thing to do because, well, the lost can be difficult themselves and are often found in difficult places. The fact is God calls us to the currents of the world. He calls us to join him in seeking out people who don't know him. He calls us to follow Paul's example here and enter into difficult places, difficult conversations. He calls us to love difficult people, to love them to the Lord. Now, think about that for a moment from your own perspective. Where is or who is your Corinth? Is it a family member who rejects God? Is it a workplace filled with co-workers who embrace sinful Corinthian behaviors? Is it a Muslim neighbor? Is it a spouse who makes fun of your faith? Where is your Corinth? Okay, time for class. What does Paul's example here show us is required of those who want to share their faith, share the cure, especially in difficult places? Well, in the first part of his Sharing the Cure 101 lecture, Professor Paul would say we need persistence. And Professor Paul practiced what he taught because his life is a perfect example of this quality. I don't know about you, but in our study of Acts so far, I've lost count of how many uh, synagogues Paul entered to tell Jews about the Christ. In spite of the beatings he received for doing that, in spite of uh, the threats to his life that forced him to leave town, either by being lowered out the window in a basket or, or leave under cover of darkness, he persisted. Paul kept on keeping on. Remember that poem by Frank Stanton? You should because I've shared it before. I want us to hear it again uh, because I think it applies. I'll say the lines, you say the refrain, and say them like you mean them, okay? If you strike a thorn or a rose, keep a going. If it hails or if it snows, taint no use to sit and whine when the fish ain't on your line. Bait your hook and keep a trying. When the weather fills your crop, kills your crop. When you tumble from the top, keep a going. Suppose you're out of every dime. Being so ain't any crime. Tell the world you're feeling prime. Keep a going. When it looks like all is up, Keep a going. Drain the sweetness from the cup. Keep a going. See the wild birds on the wing. Hear the bells that sweetly ring. When you feel like sighing, sing. Keep a going. I think the Apostle Paul might have inspired that poem because that's how he shared the gospel, the cure. He, he persisted at keeping on going, even in his, this sin-soaked, resistant of the gospel city of Corinth. Look at verse 4. Every Sabbath... He reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and Gentiles and Greeks. Verse 5, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, teaching to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Even when the Jews in that synagogue in Corinth got mad, Paul didn't quit. He just went next door and he preached to Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And several of the Jews in that synagogue went with him, including Crispus, the synagogue leader himself. Verse 8 also says that many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So his persistence paid off and that non-Jews came to Christ too. <clears throat> the lesson we should take from this part of our text is that sharing the cure requires persistence. It, it, it takes time. It, it's not an instant easy thing. Professor Paul would say, let us not grow weary in doing good. Persevere. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. You know, one of my favorite heroes of the faith is George Mueller. You might remember our little study of his life from a few years back. But <clears throat> Mueller is another example of persistence in cure sharing. In fact, I would say that Mueller had earned his doctorate in the subject because due to his never give up labors, he founded orphanage that, orphanages that housed and fed and clothed and educated over 10,000 children in his lifetime and are still active today in England. He also led countless people to faith in Christ. And I want to share an excerpt from his diary in which he, he tells about his dogged efforts, his persistence in leading five particular individuals to faith in Jesus. I'm quoting him here. 
In November 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five people. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on the land, on the sea, and whatever the pressure of my engagements might be. Eighteen months elapsed before the first of these five was converted. I thanked God and prayed for the others. Five years elapsed, and then the second came to faith. I thanked God for the second and prayed on for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them, and six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three and went on praying for the other two. These two remained unconverted, end quote. Well, 36 years later, the other two, who were sons of one of Mueller's friends, were still not Christians, and he wrote this, But I hope in God, I pray on, and I look for the answer. They're not converted yet but they will be, end quote. Well, in 1898, 52 years after he began to pray and share his faith, and after Mueller's own death, these two men finally took the cure and put their faith in Jesus. Mueller understood what Jesus meant when he told his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. Well, Paul did not give up. He persisted in sharing the cure of the gospel. Even when the Jews who had rejected his witness, in essence, took him to court. Look at verses 12 through 16 again. Well, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. The Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, you know, give his defense, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Now, this was an important ruling. Because with it, Gallio, in essence, set a precedent that legalized Christianity which meant Paul was now free to share the cure anywhere and any time he wanted. This angered those Jews, so they seized their new synagogue leader, Sosthenes, and beat him up, I guess because he had done such a bad job managing their prosecution. But even that worked for the kingdom, because when Paul later wrote to the church in Corinth, he said, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Apparently, when the Jews turned against him, Sosthenes' eyes were opened, and he put his faith in Jesus, and he actually joined Paul as a co-worker in going around the world sharing the cure. That's two converted synagogue leaders in the same city. You know, I've never considered beating as a method of evangelism, but it worked here, so maybe we should get Paula and the Tangsido people and get them out there, you know? Just kidding. To fight the good fight of the faith, though, to share the cure with a lost and dying world requires the kind of determined persistence that Paul practiced. Here's a second part of his lecture. He would say, not only do we need persistence to share the cure, we need fellowship. In other words, being persistent, hanging in there, sharing our faith, even when it's tough, requires the fellowship and the support and the prayer of other Christians. And Paul experienced that in Corinth, because remember, shortly after his arrival, perhaps as he walked through the markets, stopping at a booth of some tent makers, Paul met a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. Since tent making was also Paul's line of work, they became friends. They had a lot to talk about, you know, and, and would have spent a lot, those long winter months making sails to sail ships that sailed on the sea. Try saying that three times real fast. Remember, Paul started his cure shake, shake, sharing in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So the rest of the week, he would have worked. He had to make a living. And while cutting material and sewing them into tents and sails and awnings, it wasn't long before Paul led his two new friends to faith in Jesus. Priscilla and Aquila became deeply devoted in sharing the gospel. In fact, they decide to go with Paul when he leaves Corinth to go to Ephesus. They continue to join him in his missionary work. We're going to read about them a lot in our future study in weeks to come. But note, Paul led this couple to Jesus while at work. And I hope that will encourage some of you to use your work as a place for getting to know people, getting to understand their needs, and as a normal place, for evangelism. Work or school, if that's your line of work right now, youth, 
That's an excellent place to make contacts with people who are searching for answers in life. In any case, these two friends, these new believers, greatly encouraged Paul. They, they helped him keep a going. In the last chapter of Romans, Paul calls them fellow workers in Christ Jesus. He says they risked their lives for him. I mean, they became close friends, indeed, towers of strength for Paul as he worked there. Then Silas and Timothy showed up from Berea, and they too encouraged him by bringing news, uh, good news about the church in Thessalonica, that things were going well there, and a missionary offering from the Christians who made up the church in Philippi. Paul wrote about that in his later letter to the Philippians. He said, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I've left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. I'm sure those monetary gifts were wonderful, but, but just knowing that friends back in Philippi were thinking about him and, and praying for him, that had to give Paul a major boost. The fact is, we need others to fulfill the great commission that Jesus has given us. Fellowship, friends, are, they are an encouragement for any work that we do. I was reminded of a story I read about a few weeks ago about a bookstore in Southampton, England, uh, called October Books. Um, this little bookstore was a fixture in that city for more than four decades, but with each passing year, uh, the store struggled because the landlord kept raising their rent until it got to the point that they just could just not afford to stay in that original location. Well, last November, the owners gave their landlord notice that we're leaving because we found a new rented space, uh, which we can't afford. A, a former bank just down the road went on the market and, and that was perfect. So they, they signed a lease for, for that one. There was one logistical hurdle though. How could they move thousands of books from one storeroom to the other? Well, someone had a radical idea, form a human chain and simply pass the books handful by handful down the road. Uh, the two properties were less than a tenth of a mile apart, and the owners estimated they might be able to do that if they could persuade at least 150 people, you know, their beloved customers, to show up at the same time. Well, on the morning of the move, Claire Diaper, who is one of the workers, she woke up and she saw it was a, a bitterly cold, overcast day. And as she walked to the shop to get ready for the move, she thought, well, I bet the weather's going to keep everyone home. Instead, she found dozens of people there waiting to help. And eventually, the number grew to more than 200. And they lined up along Portswood Road. You know Portswood Road in Southampton? You know, uh, shoulder to shoulder. And, and they connected October Books uh, uh, old and, and their new storerooms, literally with that human chain. At 11 a.m., volunteers passed books from the old storeroom down the stairs onto the street, past all the fast food, mar food markets and, and coffee shops, and eventually into the vault of a freshly painted former bank. The owners had planned to move those 2,000 books in two hours. They moved them in one. Can you imagine how all those friends and supporters encouraged the owners of that that bookstore, encourage them to keep on keeping on, keep on selling books. When people come together for a common cause, amazing things can be accomplished. When Christians come together, empowered by God himself, miracles become commonplace, like starting a church in a city like Corinth. Okay, time for point three in Paul's lecture. Check your notes. To share the cure of the gospel requires persistence, it requires fellowship, but most of all, Paul would say, it requires faith. Now, think about how Paul felt when he first walked down the hill into Corinth. Um, on those 50 miles from Athens to Corinth, I, I imagine he was a bit fearful. I mean, think of it, he'd suffered terrible beatings in Philippi, uh, riots in Thessalonica and Berea, and indifference and even you know, sarcastic criticism from those Athenian eggheads on Mars Hill. And as he saw the immorality and sin of Corinth, I'm thinking surely his fears grew. In fact, we see this in his letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth later, where he confessed, he says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And I have to stop and say, there's nothing sinful about fear. 
good godly men like Paul experienced it. King David, the giant killer himself, experienced fear. These two heroes of the faith would testify that God responds to our honest fears. He responds with compassion and, and grace and help. Look at verses 9 and 10 where God says to Paul, Don't be afraid, Paul. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent, for I'm with you. And no one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. I get the image of a quarterback in my mind. I mean, he's got the ball. He's ready to pass. But he sees these 300-pound linemen and tackles headed his way. Then his teammates form a pocket around him, and he steps back into that. And there in that pocket, he's protected, and, and he has time to, to figure where to, to move the ball. Well, that's kind of what God is saying to Paul. He says, don't worry, I've, I've built a pocket around you, Paul. Keep moving the ball because there are a lot of people yet to be reached in this city. Well, Paul showed his faith in God's promise because he stayed in Corinth for nearly two more years, longer than he stayed in any other church start city other than Ephesus. Well, we need that same kind of faith to share the cure, especially these days. Faith comes from the knowledge that God is with us, that he goes before us in every faith conversation, that we have nothing to fear. This week I read about a little four-year-old girl named Sydney Farenbrook. Uh, her family had moved into a new home in Colorado, and Sydney decided that the new house needed to be inspected for monsters. Uh, so she invited a local police officer she met on the street to offer his professional opinion on the matter. Her mom says, and I'm quoting her here, she met Officer Bondé and asked him if he would come search for monsters in her house. He did. When he arrived, she told him she had just checked under the couch, but he said he wanted to make sure there weren't any monsters under the couch cushions, as you can see in this picture here. And then they ended up going into the front yard to make sure there was no monster activity there. It's just amazing the confidence he's given her. She wants to grow up and be a cop and help other people find monsters as well. By the way, I've got to tell you, after a thorough inspection, neither Sydney nor Officer Bondé discovered any trace of monster activity either in the house or outside of it. You know, like children putting their faith in their parents or a kind police officer, we can put our faith in our Heavenly Father. He loves us. He cares for us. And He is present to comfort and empower us as we work to fulfill His great commission. Okay, that's the lecture. That's the class. Before you head on to your next class, let's see if you're listening. Pop quiz time. Are you ready? To share the cure, to share the gospel, Paul would say requires three things. What's the first thing? Right. Second thing? Very good. Third thing? Everybody gets 100%. Good job. Let's pray together. Father God, as you know, we live in discouraging times, divisive times. We are enduring things that make us want to give up. Help us, Father. Encourage our hearts. Embolden us. By the power of your indwelling spirit, unite us and help us to persevere in sharing the gospel. Father, I ask that you would do miracles in and through us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, we invite you to respond any way that God leads. Profess your faith in Christ. Ask to join our church, but come, won't you?
this morning with Lord lead us to those around me. Need to church council meeting. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting. If you'd like to join uh, uh, our meeting, be a part of it, uh, contact Master Bill. He'll give you the Zoom invite and we'd love to see your picture in one of those little squares. And then I want to give you a little heads up. October the 3rd, I'm going to preach a sermon. We're going to leave Acts for just that day. I'm going to preach a sermon to remind us why we built the rock next door. Uh, Many years ago, we had the vision to do that. I wanted to re renew the vision because the Sunday after that, October the 10th, we're going to begin a campaign for us to, to pledge to give above our tithes and offerings sacrificially to pay off that mortgage. We have less than $300,000 $300, to go, and, and that's not much when you consider it costs us $4 million to build it. <coughs> Wouldn't it be great to get rid of that mortgage, get rid of that $14,000 a month payment? Uh, let's get that done in the next year or two, and we'll burn that mortgage and, and be ready to do what God wants us to do next. So be thinking about that as a family and praying to get ready for that. We'll talk more about it as we go. Let's say our benediction together as we leave. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this week, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Open up the